Welcome, and thank you for choosing the University of Washington Medical Center for your potential surgical care. I'm Brand Oschlager, and I represent the Center for Esophageal and Gastric Surgery, and we'll be talking today about your upcoming surgery, specifically about your uh, surgery for esophageal cancer. And my goal here today is to provide you and your family with information so we can work together uh, to uh, provide you excellent care with great understanding uh, from you of what's going on, going on and what uh, will happen. So I hope this is helpful and informative. In the Center for Esophageal and Gastric Surgery, we have an excellent multidisciplinary team. We have excellent surgeons who will take great care of you, but they do so with the help of many others, some of whom you will meet, others who work behind the scenes. You'll meet our residents and fellows who uh, provide an extension uh, to my hands and our care, uh, both in and out of the operating room. You, there are nurse practitioners, nurses, medical assistants, schedulers, dietitians, social workers, countless number of people who, whose job it is to make sure your experience is as safe and pleasant as possible during uh, such a big uh, operation. Let me start with a little bit of background about esophageal cancer. It is increasingly common. It's currently the third most common cancer of the GI tract, but is the, it is the cancer that is growing most rapidly uh, in the last uh, decade amongst all these types of cancer. There are two different types of esophageal cancer. There is squamous cell carcinoma, which is a cancer of the native squamous cells of the esophagus. These are more commonly in the upper and middle part of the esophagus uh, and is increasingly uh, less common uh, in this country. The most common uh, form right now is adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is almost always in, always in the lower part of the esophagus. Uh, these cancers often form from Barrett's esophagus, uh, which are uh, changes in the cell lining uh, attributable to gastroesophageal reflux uh, disease. And is, as I say, by far and away the most common type of esophageal cancer in the US today. You've already been diagnosed, but the symptoms uh, may present in a number of different ways. Usually people have some difficulty swallowing uh, with food getting stuck at that cancer. Uh, they may have anemia from some blood loss. They may uh, vomit blood or have pain uh, behind their breastbone where the cancer is. Uh, you may develop a hoarse or gravelly voice. Uh, you may have weight loss, fatigue. Uh, many symptoms can uh, can uh, show themselves. Unfortunately, in the early stages of cancer, the most common symptom is none, uh, which is why most of these cancers do get um, uh, picked up a little bit late, but hopefully you uh, are in a curable situation that we'll be able to assist with in a surgical procedure. What are the risk factors? Uh, well, male gender, uh, age over 50 are two of the biggest risk factors. Uh, there are some uh, culture and ethnicity uh, differences in risks. Uh, alcohol, tobacco are common uh, risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma. Obesity, Barrett's esophagus uh, are uh, risk factors for uh, adenocarcinoma. These cancers are usually first diagnosed uh, with an upper endoscopy, which you've probably had by now, with a biopsy. We then usually proceed with scanning looking for spread of the cancer with a CT scan and often supplementing that with a PET scan. These really are three-dimensional scans looking throughout uh, at least the chest and abdomen for any sign of metastatic cancer. We usually will get an endoscopic ultrasound, which is a small ultrasound probe at the end of a flexible scope uh, like the one used to make the initial diagnosis. This is to look at the depth of the tumor and, and uh, surrounding lymph nodes around the esophagus. And all these things uh, help us stage your cancer. And the stage will really uh, define the treatment. In the very early stages, 
of esophageal cancer, we can do just surgery alone, and that will be curative. In the later stages, uh, stage four cancers, we rarely use surgery. Most patients uh, being seen here uh, today will have a stage two or three cancer and get three different uh, modalities of treatment. And that treatment regimen would be a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, which happens for about five and a half weeks together, followed by a break of a rough, roughly six weeks, and then uh, surgery to remove the cancer of the esophagus and surrounding lymph nodes. Now, there are lo there's lots to go into determining whether you're a candidate for surgery, and if so, what type of surgery. We look at your age, your stage of cancer, the location of the tumor, what symptoms you're having, and the overall health. The operation in general that you will have for esophageal cancer is called an esophagectomy. And the basics of that operation are to remove a significant part of the esophagus that contains the cancer, as well as some normal esophagus and stomach above and below that tumor. We then usually reconstruct uh, that area that we've removed with the stomach by moving it up in place of that gap. Occasionally, we will use another st structure like the small intestine or the large intestine or colon uh, to replace uh, that esophagus. Operations for esophageal cancer are huge operations. They're probably the biggest, most risky operations that we do on, um, on the GI tract. They are, for example, more risky than most open heart surgery and are bigger than other GI operations like liver, pancreas, and colon cancers. At the University of Washington, we have worked very hard in the last two decades to decrease uh, the risk of surgery uh, for esophageal cancer. We were uh, by far the first in the region to use minimally invasive techniques uh, for esophageal uh, surgery and esophagectomy. Uh, and we utilize these techniques in essentially every patient with esophageal cancer. You'll see here some pictures of uh, an abdominal parts of an operation were open on the right versus laparoscopic on the left. Um, the most common operation that I do is called a laparoscopic assisted transhiatal esophagectomy. And I'll go over the differences between these. I do all of the types of, uh, of esophageal resections to, and use them depending on some of the factors I mentioned earlier, but especially the location and size of, of your cancer. The benefits of using minimally invasive techniques are maybe obvious, but they include smaller incisions that cause less pain, less destruction to tissue and other structures uh, uh, in and around the esophagus, uh, which leads to quicker recovery, shorter hospital stays, and potentially uh, even uh, better effects of your cancer because your immune system is not as depressed. Let me go through very briefly um, three different types of operations. Uh, or three different uh, esophagectomies, and all these can have minimally invasive techniques applied to those incisions. So let me, but, but they, they uh, are really describing the cavities in which we enter uh, to do the, the operation. I mentioned the transhiatal esophagectomy where we enter the abdominal cavity and make an incision in the neck. Uh, this is the least invasive of the operations because it avoids going into the chest. Once you go into the chest, you have to deflate a lung, uh, keep it down, uh, which increases the chance for uh, pneumonia and other lung complications. Uh, chest incisions are also inherently painful uh, and slow recovery. They require a tube in the chest and other things uh, that are uh, difficult to, to manage post-surgery. So if we can avoid it, we like to. However, sometimes we can't, and one needs to use uh, an Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, which is a, an approach through the abdomen and right chest cavity. Um, we usually use this for cancers of the lower 
uh, esophagus and upper stomach. Uh, one of the most common reasons uh, we would use this versus a transhiatal would be uh, a tumor that involves a bit more of the stomach, so we had to take remove more of the stomach and so much the stomach that it would not reach up to the neck. Uh, or there was a, a previous procedure or something done to the stomach that uh, we didn't think it was fully usable to reach up into the uh, neck region. The other one is called a total esophagectomy or, or a McEwen procedure. Some people refer to it as a three hole or a three cavity esophagectomy. So that's, an, that's when uh, we enter the neck, right chest, and abdomen. Usually we do this for tumors of the uh, middle uh, esophagus, tumors that are uh, abutting or around the trachea or airways because these tumors uh, are often uh, stuck to the, uh, to the trachea and we need to be right on directly uh, the trachea to peel uh, the tumor carefully off so that we get all the tumor uh, but do not injure uh, the trachea, which is a really devastating uh, uh, surgical complication uh, if it occurs. Uh, so we'll use it for, uh, for that purposes. I, will, I or my colleague will let you know which uh, operation uh, is best for you, but please know that, that you're in the right center because we do... Um, an esophageal resection uh, every, almost every week, and our risk of complications are as low as you will find them uh, in the US. Uh, my death rate from uh, surgery, for example, is 1%. Uh, the national average is about 10%. Uh, and uh, that's about as low for this operation that you can uh, get without taking on any high-risk patients, uh, which we do uh, every week here. I've started to touch on risks. Uh, let me go over a few of them. Uh, one of them is a leak from the connection between the esophagus, stomach, or other part of the GI tract. We manage this by uh, drainage, which may require just a tube. Sometimes it does require an operation in antibiotics. You can have uh, lung collapse, we're operating around the lungs and they can, uh, the airways can uh, collapse a little bit or get, you can have a pneumonia. There can be uh, bowel obstruction, usually that's uh, in and around the feeding tube uh, or just uh, scar tissue from ab abdominal surgery. Some patients will experience a hoarse voice. This is often from uh, a stretching of the nerve that goes to the, one of the vocal cords. Usually this is temporary if it happens and will resolve uh, in four to eight weeks. Uh, if severe, we uh, occasionally will need, need to do a uh, small bedside procedure where we inject one of the vocal cords and bulk it up so that uh, you can cough, talk, and, and do everything well and safely uh, until that nerve comes back uh, into, into good function. You certainly can have bleeding or infection. Um, these risks are pretty low and very low for this, uh, this particular operation here at our center. And finally, you can uh, experience a lymphatic leak. The, the um, body has lymph vessels uh, all throughout it, but it's especially rich in, in lymphatic uh, vessels around the esophagus. And there's a main uh, lymph vessel called the thoracic duct uh, that is uh, less than tissue paper thin and, and occasionally gets disrupted uh, by surgery uh, and has been made more fragile by radiation uh, that we uh, may need to do a subsequent procedure to plug that duct up and keep it from leaking. Let's talk about your preparation for esophagectomy. Your participation before surgery is critical to uh, the success and decreasing uh, complications after surgery. One of the best things you can do leading up to surgery is get enough exercise. Uh, I tell people that a rule of thumb is you should be walking at least a mile a day if you're going uh, to clearly be strong enough to uh, get through a surgery safely. If you can 
do more than that, great. Please keep exercising. It's only going to help you. If you don't feel like you can um, walk a mile a day, then get at it. Start working up to that. And if it, and if you have to uh, divide that mile up into three or five uh, small walks a day, do so. Whatever you can do to make your body stronger is going to help you. Nutrition. Uh, please pay a lot of attention to good nutrition. Most patients with esophageal cancer are not eating normally. And then they're going through chemotherapy and radiation and things that are going to decrease their appetite and, and willingness to eat. We really want to do everything we can to prevent you from uh, losing weight uh, during this critical time before surgery. If you are having trouble, please let your uh, oncologist know uh, know immediately if you start to lose weight. And if they aren't getting aggressive and, and your weight is not stabilizing, please let our staff know as well. There are things that we can do. And we, the last thing we want is to find that you've lost so much weight that it's not safe uh, for surgery when you come back in uh, for your preoperative appointment. You really should not be smoking. Um, smoking uh, is a difficult uh, habit to break. We appreciate that. But this operation, more than any, uh, is very risky for a smoker. Not only does it affect your lungs uh, and make lung complications uh, more frequent, it also really decreases wound healing. Uh, and it is critical for this operation that you have all the facilities possible for you to uh, to heal your incisions and uh, the reconnections and the plumbing. Please make preparations to have friends and family around after surgery. It is our hope that you'll walk out of the uh, hospital uh, under your own power uh, and that uh, you will be able to do a fair number of things for yourself at home. However, this is a big operation and having people around to uh, shop for you help you prepare meals, uh, keep an eye on you uh, for some of your activities of daily living. It's really helpful and will be beneficial to you. We know that you don't want to um, inconvenience your family and friends, but we are also confident that there are people out there that want you to do well uh, and are willing to help you in this difficult time. Reach out to them. They're there to help you. If you do have uh, special needs that you think uh, your family and friends cannot provide, please reach out to our team uh, early on. There may be things that we can do and prepare, help you prepare for uh, surgery. Finally, uh, our, our staff will talk to you about some special dietary things before surgery. Specifically, you'll be asked to take apple juice uh, the morning before your operation. A lot of people ask why this is the case. Uh, and it is because we've learned uh, very recently that if we starve patients for too long, it changes uh, some of the hormones and metabolism in their body negatively around surgery. So we try to keep uh, a little bit of sugar and, and other um, nutritional things going into your system uh, prior to surgery. So what are things going to look like when you wake up from surgery? Well, it's a big surgery and we have a lot of tubes and things coming out of you. What you'll uh, notice is that um, in the operating room, we'll have had a breathing tube in. That will come out almost always before you uh, wake up in the operating room. But you might have a sore, scratchy throat uh, for a few days, few days afterwards. Uh, you'll wake up with an oxygen mask uh, that will stay until you're breathing normally. Um, you'll have an IV. These are some of the basic things. Before surgery, you'll have an epidural catheter placed in your back. The reason for this catheter is that um, it is meant to numb the upper abdomen and chest area to decrease the pain from your incisions after surgery. Uh, it's a very safe procedure and really creates a lot of uh, benefit to decrease the overall narcotic use uh, through your veins. Uh, that will tend to make you sleep, sleepy and groggy so that you can have good pain control and be more awake to participate in your recovery. We place a tube in your nose called a nasogastric tube. 
Uh, that is there to drain your stomach so that it doesn't get too distended and put, um, put stress and tension on the connection that we just made. Usually that tube's in about two to three days. Um, we leave it in there until uh, it's putting a low enough amount out that we think that your body can easily take care of those secretions. We put a feeding tube in, into, directly into the abdomen, uh, and that will be used to supplement your nutrition in the first uh, few weeks after surgery. Now, you will start to eat approximately three or four days after surgery, at least drink. Um, and so this is just a supplement, but there's not a single person who is able in the first week to take in 100% of their uh, calorie and nutritional needs and this is a big operation that you're healing from. So a feeding tube allows us to give you all the nutrition you need to make a maximum uh, recovery. There'll usually be a surgical drain. Uh, depending on the procedure, it will be in your neck or in your chest. Uh, that stays in uh, for most of your hospital stay and you will usually be removed uh, before you leave. And that's just there in case there's a problem from any of your connections and there's a leakage that hopefully that will contain the leak and not require more surgery. You usually wake up with a uh, catheter in your bladder. Uh, we'll keep that for a, uh, a day or two uh, and then remove it. And that is there to monitor your urine output. And also in the first day uh, with the epidural catheter, you're probably uh, not feeling like getting up every two hours to go to the bathroom and it allows a little bit more uh, convenience uh, to you uh, and your mobilization. And finally, you'll have some leg uh, devices. They're called sequential compression devices or SCDs. They're there to uh, push on your calves and help your blood circulate to prevent, uh, prevent blood clots uh, in your legs. Those are the main things that you'll wake, wake up with and find. And what will happen is over the uh, over the six or seven days that you're here, every day or every other day, we'll be taking one of these tubes out uh, so that by the end, uh, you'll go home with the feeding tube, uh, but hopefully no other tubes uh, left attached. So what else is gonna happen in the hospital? First of all, a family member can visit. Uh, you may spend a night in the ICU. If so, uh, we usually ask uh, that the families stay in the waiting room or take that night off, but on the, on the floor, uh, a family member is allowed to stay if they choose on a small uh, cot that can be brought in. Uh, we will uh, crush and your medications or give them to you in liquid form, and we're gonna get you active as soon as possible. We want you to be out of bed and starting to walk the day after surgery. Sure, it's a big operation and you will probably be in some pain, but that really is critical to get you going, get your lungs expanded, get the blood moving to prevent blood clots, and is one of the most important things you can do to decrease uh, complications uh, within and after the hospital. We'll be monitoring your nutrition. We'll tell you when uh, you can start eating and drinking and starting the tube feeds. Don't worry about that, uh, but we will ask you to be a participant in, uh, in, in learning what you need to know upon discharge for that. And you'll be given a, uh, a breathing exercise machine called an incentive spirometer. It's a blue plastic uh, device that you blow into to try to help re-expand the lungs. Next to, next to walking, this is the most um, important thing that you can do to speed your recovery and decrease the risk of complications. Within six to seven days, we hope to have you out of the hospital. Um, if you live more than two hours away, we will probably uh, ask you to stay in the Seattle area for up to another week. Uh, this is mainly so that if there are any complications or problems, we can address them immediately uh, and, and safely. Uh, uh, and if you live quite far away, that, that will be difficult and we worry that we won't be able to get to those problems in a timely manner. We hope that if you're staying in Seattle, you're doing all the things you would normally do at home, getting up, getting about, and, and being active and uh, pushing your, uh, your recovery forward. You obviously should have someone to drive you home. You should uh, come prepared with loose, comfortable clothing. Uh, 
Um, you may want to bring a pillow for comfort and support. Probably not going to want to, uh, to drive for at least two weeks after surgery, especially while you're taking prescription pain medication. Uh, you're not going to swallow whole pills for about four to six weeks. All your medications will be crushed or in liquid form. Our team and our pharma, uh, pharmacists will go through all your medications and make sure they're in a safe form uh, for you to go home and explain those to you. Controlling your pain is very important to us. There are a lot of things we, we recommend around this. I've already mentioned the epidural catheter, um, but there are many things besides narcotic uh, pain medications uh, that you can use to reduce your pain. And we encourage you to use these things. Having music around both in and outside the hospital, we found often helps soothe people and, and decreases their pain ice to incisions or swollen areas is another adjunct that people find effective. You want to make liberal use of Tylenol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen and use those when you have mild to moderate pain rather than going straight to uh, narcotics. Remember there are many adverse uh, effects of prescription pain medications like dizziness, nausea, constipation, and drowsiness, all of which uh, we, you will want to avoid if possible. That being said, uh, if you have severe pain or have difficulty sleeping uh, because of pain, we do want uh, this to be controlled and we will send you home with pain medication to help you. Diet and nutrition are one of the big things that we have to adjust to uh, after esophageal uh, removal. You'll be getting two feeds as we mentioned. You'll be on a progressive a soft diet on the way home. What you really want to do is be very careful to eat slowly and drink slowly very frequently through the day. Uh, you want to think five, six or more meals a day, maybe sipping and drinking fluid almost constantly through the day and not trying to compress your food and, and liquid intake into the two or three meals a day that you might have normally uh, been used to. You will be able to compress some of that with time, uh, but in the early stages, we encourage you to spread them out uh, so that you don't fill your stomach up too much at any one time. And if you feel full, please stop. Your stomach is, is just it needs more time uh, to digest what you have and slow down and space things out. Fortunately, again, you have the feeding tube to help supplement things, and so you can let it do its job if you're not able to eat. Other aspects of activity. We want you to be active. We want you to walk uh, as much as uh, possible without getting to the uh, point of severe fatigue. We, we want you to be active, but it's going to be progressive. We want you to avoid heavy lifting. 15 pounds is a good guide some uh, bigger, stronger people might be able to do a little more, some people a little less, but really just don't use your abdominal muscles uh, for uh, lifting objects uh, in the first six weeks. You're probably gonna wanna avoid most, most strenuous act activities like running or going to the gym for about six weeks, but we do want you uh, walking frequently, at least three times a day and trying to get back to that mile a day you were doing before surgery as much as or as quickly as possible. Uh, we'll ask you to take the breathing uh, tube, the incentive spirometer home with you and continue to do those breathing exercises to regain all of your lung capacity that you might have uh, um, lost or was decreased with surgery. And you can resume most of your other activities. Uh, people often ask, ask about when is it safe for me to resume sexual activity? Usually somewhere in the two to four week time period is, is um, a good rule of thumb. But for all this, let pain be your guide. You need to push through a little bit of pain to get out of, the bed, get out of bed, get off the sofa and go walk. But otherwise, before going to the gym or engaging in sexual activity, things like this, if you're having pain um, and you're not able to do these things because of pain, that's probably where your limit is uh, for now. And you'll get back to those uh, things quite soon. We're very confident of that. It's important to take good care of your wounds. 
your wounds will probably have little butterfly bandages that we call steri strips on them. Please don't remove those in the first week after surgery. Most of that time you'll be in the hospital. Uh, they'll fall off in about a week or two in most cases. In some cases, they'll stay on, and if you want to, after a week or two, start to remove them, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, people often find that they're easiest to get off in the shower after you get them a little bit wet. In the first uh, couple weeks, it's good to uh, not get your incisions too wet. Don't soak in a tub or a pool. Uh, showering is fine. Getting it a little wet is, is okay, especially to clean uh, the area, but dry them off and keep Keep your skin around, in and around the incision as, as dry as possible. Keep an eye on it. If you notice any increased pain, redness, swelling, or foul-smelling discharge, or, or increased discharge from your wounds, please let us know. Don't apply anything uh, to your incisions. There's a lot of over-the-counter um, salves or, or ointments uh, people will recommend. Um, generally, Soap, water, and keeping it dry is the best medicine uh, for surgical incisions and not uh, over-the-counter antibiotic creams or otherwise. When you leave, you should have a follow-up appointment uh, to meet with our uh, surgical team and dietitian. It'll usually be in the first two to three weeks unless specified uh, by us otherwise. And then we will see you uh, every few weeks until you're back to eating um, enough that you can have the feeding tube removed and we'll take that tube out in clinic. It's really not much of a procedure. We just cut the little stitches that are keeping it affixed to the skin and we just uh, pull it off, pull it out. It's not very painful uh, at all. Uh, and then we'll uh, follow you uh, until we are all comfortable that you're uh, okay to be uh, seen and followed by your primary care doctor uh, and probably oncologist who will be the main person to do your long-term cancer screening, surveillance, and follow-up. If you have any questions, uh, please call us. We have a team uh, at all times waiting to take care of you and answer your questions. But let me give you a sense of some things that you uh, may want to call about or we want you to call about. Uh, if you're unable to take in food or liquid, especially if uh, you were able to um, do so in the preceding days and now you're not able to, call us. If you can't keep fluid down, call us. If you start vomiting despite uh, taking the anti-nausea medication that we send you home with, give us a call. Uh, if you have symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath uh, without exerting yourself, give us a call. You should not have se severe increasing pain uh, that is not controlled by um, the pain medication we sent you home with. If you are, if you are experiencing uh, significant pain, give us a call. If you're having any trouble feeling distended, uh, having uh, a lot of trouble moving your bowels uh, and feeling really backed up, let us know. It, it is common to feel a little constipated and, and not, be, not get back to a regular bowel movement cycle. Um, that will come as your bowels wake up and you get rehydrated. Uh, but if it's taken a, a significant turn backwards, please uh, let us know. We may be able and probably can help. If you have dizziness, fainting, any signs of de dehydration, uh, let us know about that uh, as well. If you have weakness, numbness, tingling of your extremities, uh, if one of your legs or arms feels uh, warm, painful, swollen, let us know. They could be signs of a blood clot. Uh, if you notice any bleeding from your incisions, let us know. And certainly any signs of infections like a high fever, uh, shaking or chills, increased drainage from your wounds, uh, redness um, more than a half, a half an inch around the incision, uh, those are signs and symptoms that you could have an infection uh, and that we, we may need to take a look at you. And here are the numbers to call both during the day and outside of the day. As I said, there's always uh, a member of our team uh, standing by to take care of you. We want this to be the safest uh, experience possible uh, and give you the information you need to make a rapid and complete recovery from esophageal surgery. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. 
Uh, I, we really look forward to taking care of you here at the University of Washington in the Center for Esophageal and Gastric Surgery. We have developed a tremendous amount of uh, experience in treating esophageal cancer, and we look forward to taking care of you over the next few weeks. Thank you.